good morning uh, today we are discussing about bone destruction patterns or bone destruction in periodontal disease so uh, we should uh, before uh, going to periodontal disease and we should have an understanding about the alve alveolar bone morphology mm -hmm. so look at this uh, diagram here you can see alveolar uh, process uh, holding and supporting a tooth and the basal bone and within the alveolar process what we have is cortical bone as well as spongy bone we have cortical plates both outer as well as inner cortical plates then the spongy bone or the cancellous bone is that part of alveolar bone that occupies the space between the cortical plates now when we uh, look at the histological aspect of alveolar bone what we have is uh, a hevation system and osteon osteon is the structural and functional unit of alveolar bone what is this osteon the osteon has got blood vessels lymphatic system at the center surrounded by numerous bony lamellae they are called the concentric lamellae so that is surrounding each blood vessel surrounding this uh, blood vessel that is occupying the center of osteon so within the cortical bone we have numerous osteons mm -hmm. so these several osteons uh, are surrounded by circumferential lamellae and in between this concentric lamellae or in between this osteons what we have is interstitial lamellae this is how a compact bone compact bone is seen under a histopathologically how does uh, what are the structures uh, that are present within a cortical bone now what about uh, the trabecular bone or cancellous bone it has got numerous trabeculae within it and in between the trabeculae a uh, space is filled with bone marrow alveolar bone it has got both it constantly undergoes remodeling so it has got a formative phase as well as it has got a resorptive phase the cells that are involved in formation are osteo blast whereas the cells that are involved in resorption are osteoclast the osteocytes are the resting osteoblast there are cells that are residing within lacunar spaces within the alveolar bone osteocytes these osteocytes depending upon the stimulus it receive it transforms into either osteoblast for bone formation or it transforms into an osteoclast which is a multinucleated cell for bone resorption so uh, this is uh, now what happens to this alveolar bone in periodontal disease see here you can clearly see that alveolar bone morphology or the contour of the alveolar bone it changes um, from tooth to tooth it is different in maxilla it is different in mandible it is different for anteriors it is different for posteriors now what happens to this alveolar bone in periodontal disease look at this uh, picture here stick reduction in the amount of alveolar bone there is bone loss here this is a site uh, surgically opex alveolar bone ledges then so now let's see how does uh, bone loss occur in periodontal disease what are the mechanisms involved in bone destruction in periodontal disease so there are different reasons for bone loss one of the main reason for bone loss is gingival inflammation the extension of gingival inflammation into the underlying bone apart from gingival inflammation trauma from occlusion can cause bone loss several systemic disorders can produce bone loss first let's have a look into gingival inflammation and periodontal destruction how does gingival inflammation result in bone loss hmm. so gingival inflammation 
occurs in response to microbial challenge in the gingival sulcus area. When the microbial challenge or the plaque and calculus that is causing this gingival inflammation or the causative factors has not been removed, the gingival inflammation gradually extends into the underlying tissues. And what we have underlying or what we have beneath the soft tissue, beneath these soft tissues are the hard tissues, that is alveolar bone that is present just below the gingiva. We know that periodontal disease has got both periods of rest as well as periods of destruction. So this alveolar bone destruction occurs or bone destruction occurs mainly during the periods of activity of or active periods of periodontal disease. Mm -hmm. Gingival inflammation extends to the underlying periodontium through different ways. Mm -hmm. And number of factors influence this pathway of gingival inflammation to the underlying bone. Those are one of the major factors that is just, uh, or that is involved is uh, uh, influencing this uh, extension of inflammation to the underlying tissue as width of attached gingiva. So in areas where there is adequate attached gingiva, this inflammation, this extension of inflammation to the underlying tissues is controlled. Or attached gingiva, the presence of attached gingiva prevents the extension of inflammation into the underlying tissues. These are the different ways by which gingival inflammation extends into underlying bone. Gingival inflammation can extend either directly into the alveolar bone. Usually this gingival inflammation, it travels along the collagen fibers, sir, along the course of blood vessels. It extends into the underlying alveolar bone, either through the outer periosteum, through the vessels that are present within the outer periosteum, it enters the marrow spaces of alveolar bone. In the interdental area, I, in the interdental areas, the gingival inflammation extends into the crest of alveolar bone, then from the crest of alveolar bone, through the vessels, uh, through the crestal vessels that are present, it enters the marrow spaces. Or in some cases, the inflammation even extend into the periodontal ligament area, into the vessels, uh, into the connective kind of tissue area of periodontal ligament. From there, in, from there, it extends into the alveolar bone marrow spaces. So there are different ways by which gingival inflammation extends in, into the underlying alveolar bone. So once the inflammation reaches the alveolar bone, then it spreads into marrow spaces. So the marrow spaces then, then will get infiltrated by inflammatory infiltrate, which will be having all the blood vessels, all the neutrophils, all the proliferating fibroblast. Gradually, they'll be replaced by all the phagocytic cells, multinuclear osteoclast, hmm, resorbing bone. So as the resorption progresses, there occurs thinning of bony trabeculae and enlargement of marrow spaces, ultimately resulting in destruction of alveolar bone height. This is an enlarged picture of a bony trabeculae. We know that osteoblasts are the cells, bone forming cells, they usually line the outer surface of a bony trabeculae. And we have osteoprogenitor cells. They are always seen in the periosteal portion of alveolar bone. That is the outer lining of peri outer lining of alveolar bone. We have periosteum, which is rich in osteoprogenitor cells. According to the signal they receive, the osteoprogenitor cells, they transform into osteoclast or osteoblast. In areas of bone resorption, they transform into osteoclast. And these osteoclasts, they occupy resorption base called Hauschitz lacunae. Mm -hmm. And it is from this area, they'll produce all the uh, acidic, uh, they'll produce all the enzymes and the acidic environment for bone destruction. Mm -hmm. 
It has been found out that the microbial microbes that are present within the plaque, it has got a particular area in which it can act and produce alveolar, act and uh, result in loss of alveolar bone. That has been found out to be uh, 1.5 to 2.5 mm. So this is the reason why the interproximal angular defects, hmm, it occurs only in spaces, only in areas where the bone width is more than 2.5 mm. That is the reason why the vertical or angular bone loss does not occur in lower anterior areas where the amount of bone is less, where the amount of cancellous bone is less. Because here, marrow spaces will be destroyed entirely. The interproximal angular defect, it can appear only in spaces that are wider than 2.5 mm because bone marrow spaces will get completely destroyed. That is called radius of action. The area or uh, within which the microbial plug has got its action on bone. That is radius of action. Then it has been found out that in an area with uncontrolled periodontal disease or an untreated periodontal disease, the amount of bone loss that can occur on the facial surface and proximal surface is different. It has been found out to be 0.2 mm for facial surfaces and 0.3 mm for the interproximal surfaces. Then we know that periodontal disease has got periods of uh, destruction as well as periods of rest. So periods of destruction is always associated with ulceration, gingival ulceration, pocket epithelial ulceration, as well as inflammatory infiltration, both in the gingival tissues as well as in the underlying alveolar bone. And it has been found out that there occurs a conversion of cells from the T lymphocyte to B lymphocytes during this periods of bone destruction. And it is also associated with a change in an environment that is with a change. There occurs a change in the microbial flora. Hmm? There occurs an increase in the amount of unattached, mobile, gram negative, and anaerobic pocket flora. Hmm? And uh, during the periods of remission, gradually the flora reverts into gram positive, non motile organisms. Hmm? Then, so uh, now uh, what happens in bone destruction? So once the inflammatory infiltrate that is involved in bone destruction, which are the inflammatory mediators involved in bone destruction, we know that osteoclast are the cells hmm, involved in bone destruction. Apart from that, several toxic mediators, inflammatory mediators produced from the microbes can also directly result in bone destruction. Several host factors are released by uh, released from the body against the microbial challenge, like prostaglandins, interleukin one alpha, beta, interleukin one beta, as well as TNF alpha, are also associated with bone destruction. So here, alveolar bone loss is due to either direct activity of the microbes through the toxic mediators produced from the microbes, or it is through the or it is also due to the host response that is acting against the microbial challenge, even ultimately resulting in activation of osteoclast causing resorption of bone. So when the gingival inflammation or when the inflammation is not confined to the gingival tissues, when it is not kept under control, the inflammation extends into the underlying alveolar bone, underlying heart tissues resulting in its own destruction. Uh, this is an osteoclast occupying a resorption bay or a house ship's lacunae. Mm -hmm. See, it has got a ruffle border, the osteoclast, which is a multinucleated cell. Uh, it, has, it has formed a ruffle border across this uh, resorption bay through which it will be releasing um, H plus, it will be creating an acidic environment and it will be even releasing enzymes for the bone destruction. Along with the bone destruction in periodontal disease, there occurs bone formation in order to compensate for the bone destruction. So, in, so bone destruction occurs in one part of the bony trabeculae, 
whereas bone formation occurs in the other part of bony trabeculae that at a distance or uh, slightly away from the area of inflammation and that bone formation is known as buttressing bone formation and the buttressing bone formation when it occurs in the central part of the alveolar bone hmm, sometimes it can occur within the alveolar bone it can occur in the it can even occur on the outer aspects of alveolar bone that is called peripheral buttressing bone formation and the other one is called central buttressing bone formation then so this is this was the main reason for bone destruction gingival inflammation now coming to the second uh, major factor involved in bone destruction that is trauma from occlusion so trauma from occlusion it can directly produce bone loss without causing gingival inflammation sometimes it can occur together that is uh, gingival inflammation and trauma from occlusion can uh, occur together so uh, how how does bone destruction occurs just with trauma from occlusion trauma from occlusion produces compression of periodontal ligament it will produce compression and tension in the periodontal ligament area resulting in activation of osteoclast thereby producing necrosis of uh, periodontal ligament as well as resorption of alveolar bone however all these changes or the bone loss that is caused by trauma from occlusion is reversible to a certain extent so whenever the occlusal force exceed a particular limit whenever it goes beyond the physiologic limit it will result in compression of periodontal ligament space increase osteoclastic activity it will cause necrosis of the periodontal ligament and ultimately it will result in resorption of alveolar bone here you can uh, see a tooth under trauma from occlusion and the alveolar bone loss that has occurred due to trauma in case of uh, trauma from occlusion if present along with gingival inflammation the gingival it can uh, if the trauma from occlusion is present along with gingival inflammation the gingival inflammation can spread even faster it spreads uh directly with the periodontal ligament area then to the alveolar bone resulting in angular bony defects bone destruction can also occur due to cert, uh, due to various systemic disorders like osteoporosis it's commonly seen in postmenopausal women it is uh, also seen in certain diseases like hyperparathyroidism leukemia certain skeletal in generalized skeletal disturbances number of factors can affect bone destruction patterns in periodontal disease one of the even the normal variation in the alveolar bone can have an influence on the bone destruction in periodontal disease sometimes uh, we know that the thickness width and the crustal angulation of interdental septa it is different in different areas it is different for maxilla it is different in mandible it is different for the anterior as well as the posterior region then the thickness of the facial and lingual alveolar plate then if uh, penetrations and dehiscences are present alignment of teeth the root trunk and root and the root trunk anatomy the position of the root within the alveolar process the proximity of a particular tooth with the adjacent tooth all these factors can influence alveolar bone destruction patterns isolated areas of bone denudation of bone is known as a Uh, they are called fenestrations see this is a fenestration where there in which uh, the marginal bone is intact areas of denudation of bone even involving marginal bone is known as a dehiscence hmm? one of the most common pattern of bone destruction that is seen in periodontal diseases horizontal bone loss this is uh, how horizontal in area with horizontal uh, bone loss appear this is very commonly seen here uh, here such a type of bone loss occurs due to the inflammation extent of uh, extension of inflammation directly into the crest of bone and such a type of bone loss usually result in supra bony pocket now we have the vertical bony defect or the angular defects such defects usually occur in oblique direction thereby leaving a hollowed out trough in the bone along the root they are seen on the facial aspect on the lingual aspect or even in the interdental areas they have been found to be 
uh, uh, vertical or angular defects, they have been found to have different uh, architecture. Either they can have a single wall, so they are called a single wall vertical defect, or they can have two walls. So this is a two wall vertical defect. They can have three walls. This is a vertical defect, but with three walls. So this is a three wall vertical or angular defect. This is how uh, an angular defect or a vertical bony defect appear under a radiograph. Hmm. Vertical defects or angular defects occurs whenever the inflammation travels into the periodontal ligament area. Hmm. So such a type of bone loss produce infra bony pocket. Such angular bony defects are not commonly seen in lower anterior area. See, this is, this is because lower anterior area usually does not have much amount of cancellous bone. In those areas, the cortical plates are mostly fused. So angular bony defects does not occur, rather horizontal defects are more common in lower anteriors. Vertical defects or angular defects are more commonly seen in posteriors where there is abundant cancellous bone. Then, so this is a vertical or an angular bony defects. It can be one wall, two wall, or three wall. Uh, this is a three wall uh, vertical uh, defect or a circumferential bony defect. Now we have osseous craters. Osseous craters are the most commonest bony defect seen in periodontal disease in the interdental area. They are bony concavities that are confined within the interdental area. They are confined within the facial and the lingual walls. They'll be having a concavity. Hmm. Uh, there are many uh, reasons for the high occurrence of such craters. Hmm. One is mostly th these areas are difficult to clean and maintain. Hmm. These areas, apart from that, the alveolar bone crest, it has got a rich vascular supply. Then even the contour of the alveolar bone in this area hmm, is also, uh, especially in the molar area, lower molar area, is another reason for the development of craters. Then bulbous bony contours. These are bulbous bony condos. They are bony enlargements. Hmm? Uh, either due to exostosis or it can even be due to trauma from occlusion. That is buttressing bone formation. The bone formation here occurs in compensation to the bone destruction that is occurring in trauma from occlusion. So in order to compensate for the bone destruction occurring in trauma from occlusion, there occurs bone formation. So this is a classic example of peripheral buttressing bone formation. And it has been found out that it is more commonly seen in maxilla. Then coming to the bony architecture, reversed architecture. This is seen, reverse architecture is very commonly seen in periodontal disease. See bony architecture or ideal bony architecture or a positive architecture. This is how it appears. Here, the interdental bone is always at a higher level than the facial and the lingual plates. In some cases, due to bone loss, they'll be at the same level. Then it is known as a flat bony architecture. In some cases, that is mainly in periodontal disease, you can see a reverse architecture or a negative bone architecture. They are produced due to the loss of interdental bone, including the facial plates, lingual plates, without concomitant loss of radicular bone. So here radicular bone will be intact, but there will be loss of interdental bone. Reverse architecture. Now we have the ledges. Ledges are also uh, common, um, commonly seen, very commonly seen in periodontal disease. They are thick and bony margins due to resorption of thick and bony plates. They are plateau-like bony margins due to resorption of thickened bony plates, very commonly seen in periodontal uh, disease. Hmm. Then percussion involvement. Percussion involvement is involvement of uh, percussion area by the periodontal disease. Usually it can be either bifurcation or trifurcation of a multi-rooted teeth, more commonly seen in mandibular molars. Hmm. 
they can be they have been uh, graded according to the uh, depth of involvement according to the degree of involvement they have been graded grade 1 means incipient bone loss in grade 2 there will be partial or uh, initial stage of bone loss uh, then in grade 3 there will be bone loss in the percussion area causing a uh, through and through opening of the percussion but there won't be any soft tissue loss but in grade 4 there is through and through involvement along with soft tissue loss uh, there are uh, classic uh, instruments available for the clinical examination of percussion like neighbors pro you can also uh, uh, examine uh, you can also identify percussion involvement under a radiograph so we have seen that uh, alveolar bone destruction occurs in periodontal disease different patterns of bone destruction are seen in periodontal disease and the most common reason for valvular bone destruction is gingival inflammation. Then trauma from occlusion and several systemic diseases can also cause alveolar bone destruction. Different bone destruction patterns are seen in periodontal disease. Ledges, bulbous bony condos, percussion involvement, then reverse architects, the bony architecture is found to be altered in periodontal disease. So the coming uh, once uh, you have to manage hmm? uh, coming to the when we look at the management of periodontal uh, patient with periodontal disease when you uh, open a flap in a particular area hmm? only if you have only if you have an understanding about these the normal bony contour and what is normal in that particular area how the bone should appear how the bone should be in an um, in a particular area, how the contour of bone should be, how its architecture should be in a particular area, you can manage that particular case. So you should have an understanding about the basic anatomy of the alveolar bone in every area, anteriors as well as in posteriors, in lingual aspect, and what is normal and what is abnormal. You should have an understanding of both these and how they can be corrected. So you should have a thorough knowledge about the alveolar bone, alveolar bone, the basic anatomy of the alveolar bone, the destruction pattern, how does it occur, which are the destruction patterns before managing a case of periodontal disease. Thank you.